What's up, Mandate family? I've got another fantastic episode here for you today. I'm joined by a new friend of mine, Eric Nielsen. He is the CEO of a company that is just about to launch called TAG. He spent the last 25 years at the intersection of product development and marketing. He's recently named the head of marketing strategy for Southwest Airlines and is a globally recognized game creator, having won a Global Game of the Year nomination from Link. So Eric is launching TAG this week that we're recording and is about to welcome twins into the world with his wife, Kelly. So today we're going to talk about his journey with mental health, from how he's dealt with anxiety and depression, going on medication, getting into therapy, and really how that journey has helped him get to why he started TAG and what his vision is for that company. He's all, we're also going to talk about what he's looking forward to as a dad, how he's caring and supporting his wife through all of this, his biggest fears as a father, and a whole lot more. So with that, let's jump in. Go chat with Eric. Welcome to The Mandate, a show featuring intimate conversations about men's mental health, masculinity, and identity. We bring you stories to inspire you, experts to guide you, and the tools you need to become the man you truly want to be. It's time to sit back, relax, and open up. Live from The Mandate Studio in Austin, Texas, here's your host, Adam Hoffman. All right, Eric, thanks for joining me today. How are you? Hey, Adam, doing well, and yourself? I'm, I'm great, but I, like, really, how are you doing? You are about to launch a startup and have twins sometime in the next, I think, week or maybe a couple days. Yeah, yeah it's launch week in a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah, so we have twins. We have a boy and a girl coming, Foster and Ellington. Uh, they will be here if all goes well, knock, knock, knock. We've got a C-section that's scheduled for Wednesday of next week, so a week from yesterday, right around the okay. corner. And, uh, and the, the company, TAG, launches this week as a soft launch, and then we'll be in testing next week. So I have my hands full. It sounds like it. Well, we are, we're going to talk about your journey with mental health, starting the company, all the launches that are happening in the next seven, seven days with you. But what I'm super excited about is that we're going to do this as a, as a two-part series. So you'll be here kind of pre, pre-launch and then you know, whatever the, the right time is for you, one month, two months, kind of post-launch, we'll see how you're doing, how you're taking care of yourself and, and all that so that as other men who maybe they're not doing both things in the same week, but they can get a, get a sense of what self-care looks like and, and what's top of mind for you. I like it. You'll get me pre-zombie and zombie. So it'll be good. There we go. Harrison there. Yeah. Lot, lots of learnings to be had. Well, let's... Let's jump in. I always like to ask people what what has been your personal journey with mental health and well being. Yeah, absolutely. No, and let me first say too that I love that you're doing this. We spoke a little bit about what mandate is. I'm sure you you know, people know when they come, but I haven't seen anything out here that specifically addresses uh, the issues of men. So men to men and mental health. And it's fantastic. Kudos to you on that. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. So my story. Um, I guess you could say, you know, we have a little bit of anxiety and depression that runs in the family, a little. Um, got a couple of cousins that have dealt with it and, and various others. And really for me, it kicked in. So I, this is my second marriage. Uh, I like to call my first one my practice marriage. If you if you play golf, uh, I'll call it a mulligan, right? Yanked it into the woods. Um, but I was young, probably too young. And so we ended up getting a divorce and, and that you know, it takes a toll emotionally. And uh, if anybody's been through it, it's just sort of your whole world just flips on a dime. And uh, your financial world's impacted, your your professional world, you know, what you're able to do. Um, and so, it, you know, it sent me into, it started with anxiety and then it sent me into a depression. And I think like a lot of people, for me, you know, that was a low. Uh, and then And then I reached for the quick fix. Right. So I reached for medications. I saw a psychiatrist first and got on various benzos, various other things. And so that took what would be a normal depression and just sent me off a cliff. I didn't react very well at all to those medications. And, you know, that's common 
uh, meds are trial and error. You can, you can ask any psychiatrist, right? Everybody's body's different. The chemistry is different. And so for me, I went into a deep, dark black hole, you know, suicidal ideation. I mean, I had never experienced that before. I think that's probably the worst human emotion you can experience, you know, just wanting to end it. I, my heart goes out to people that have been through that. Wow. Yeah. And so, so it wasn't until I found a really good therapist to talk things out um, that things started to change for me and they changed dramatically. And so that was a big aha for me. That was, you know, why, why don't you therapy in the same way that we value meds? You know, we want the quick fix. We want to see that there's a magic pill out there for something, but for mental health, it's never just the meds. You know, that's a band aid that'll get you to, you know, potentially a stable state, but you, you really got to get to the core of the issues and you got to talk it out. If you're going to get to quote unquote, a cure, you know, a place where you're going to feel a lot better. And so it just kind of always struck me, you know, that this was just this huge thing out there that was really untapped and it was partly untapped because of the stigma. You know, you, you, you get, you, know, you get labeled. I think it's getting better now. You know, you see a lot of, um, you know, high profile folks speaking out against it, but it's still there. And it's also there uh, differently in various communities and cultures. Some cultures, it, it is still just absolutely taboo. So um, kind of got to the place where, you know, you get the, the itch for the side gig, the next gig. I've done that all my life. I, I've sort of bounced from the day job to the new venture and back and forth um, lots of times. And so this just came around and, and, it, and it really, you know, we wanted to do something. I wanted to do something that had a level of engagement that didn't feel like work. Before we jump into tag, you mind if I ask you a couple of questions about your, uh, your personal experience? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So talk, talk us through a little bit after you're coming out of your, your first marriage, your practice marriage, I think is, as you put it so ele elegantly, mm -hmm. and you said, I've got anxiety and depression. What, what did that feel like for you? You know, if, for me, you, you can't get out of your head. You know, you can't get out of your thoughts. You can't escape them. You can't, it's, you, you just turn inwards. I, I think one of the best things that I heard from my therapist, you know, you, the self-talk just gets terrible, right? You're worthless. You're this, you're that, you're never going to be this, you know, you, you know, you turn inward and you turn on yourself. And my therapist, who I still see uh, from time to time, she said, all right, I want to do an exercise with you. I want you to tell me how you talk to yourself. And I did. And then she said, now I want you to imagine that a friend of yours has those same thoughts or those same issues are going on in their life. Right. So they got a divorce. You know, they took a hit all all around in life. Um, what would you tell them? Would you tell them the same thing that you tell yourself? And I said, well, no, of course not. Absolutely not. She was, well, then why are you talking to yourself that way? I mean, there are these little ahas that pop up that you just they're in your blind spot. I remember that was a that was a huge session. Lots of tears, you know, lots of emotion like, oh, my God. Um, I like to share that with friends that are going through the same thing, but it's, um, for me, that's what it was. It was really just negative self-talk and it just gets self-defeating. Uh, and it's hard to build even small wins when you're in that state. I hear you on that, that, that self-talk, my, my therapist would call it the monsters on the bus. And, and I love, I, that was a great visual for me, but I also love these, I don't want to, uh, techniques, we'll, we'll call them, that, that therapists have to just help us sort of reframe what's going on. And the, would, would you tell this to a friend? Say, Heck no. I mean, I mean, in some cases you might think it and be like, hey, go, can you please go and help yourself? But what you really want to tell them is like, I care about you. I see, I see you. None of this stuff is actually true. And, you know, it's almost like you could just have, if you could just have your brain be that friend as opposed to your, your enemy, that'd be a, it'd be a nice movement mm -hmm. uh, to get us going forwards. And I think the other, the other piece that I want to touch on is you started off with medication, which isn't unheard of by any means. I think it's pretty normal for actually somebody to go see their regular doctor and have them be like, yeah, I think, I think you should get on some antidepressants. Here you go. You know, ther therapy optional, but just take these and it'll balance you out. Did you end up going back on 
But did you stay on medication after you were working with a therapist as well? Yeah, I did. And I think that the combination is important. I, I don't think that one without the other is the solution. I think if you do have a chemical imbalance that's going on, absolutely, you got to find the right medication. And it really depends on the severity and the type of condition. You know, if you're talking about schizophrenia uh, or, you know, your, your, your average uh, daily depression, you know, that, that the meds are important. They're really important. But not without the therapy. You absolutely need both, the one-two punch, uh, to really start to see gains. Yeah, and it's not to say that ever, everybody, well, no, I take that back. I do believe that it's okay for, and everybody should go and see a therapist at some point in time. And we we had a one of my friends on, Jonathan, recently, who was, he started a company called Reflect, and they help people find the right therapist for them. And so they're all about, you know, finding the the patient therapist fit, although I think he has a better better term for it, um, to, to help get you there. And one of his recommendations was, if you don't think that you need one, take the time now to go and find somebody that you resonate with so that when you do end up needing one, which will probably happen at some point, you've, you've got that work and you've, you've kind of done it. What was it like for you finding a therapist? You know, and on that note, let me, let me pick it back yeah. up. So one of our um, clinicians at TAG, she likes to talk about having a therapist like having a dentist. You know, you, you have, you got teeth, you got a doctor, you got you know, all this stuff. You go to a dentist. But why don't we have anything for the brain? I mean, it's the most important organ, right? And um, she says, you know, you, you go see them once a year, every six months as a checkup. Hey, everything going good? Yep. And then when you get cavities, you need to see them, you know, more directly. You do. And then you go back to maintenance mode. So, yeah, no, I believe that everybody should. Um, yeah. So uh, what, what was your question after that? Uh, what was it like for you finding a therapist? You know, I went on... I went through a couple. My ex-wife at the time was seeing a couple different people. Um, and so I, I did a little bit of trial there, but there wasn't a fit. Um, then went on my own to try and find some, uh, did a couple interviews, wasn't a fit. You really need to find the right person. And then I went on to a, I think it was therapy finder uh, and did a whole bunch of research there. I also wanted somebody that was close. At that time I lived in Santa Monica. So needed somebody that was, you know, nearby, um, good proximity, and this found a rock star. And it's been great ever since, you know, it really has. And, and it goes beyond, you know, that kind of a relationship goes beyond whatever the issue of the day is. And you really start to look at just holistically, you know, how are you managing your life? Um, kind of life coach type stuff, you know, I think mm -hmm. that things start to evolve, so. Yeah. Same sim similar journey there with with therapy was it started off as like I really just need help to get out of this dark place, and then it turned into okay things are feeling pretty good like where what do we do now, and yeah. and yeah it gets it gets more coachy but it's it's really just having a person that's looking out for your best interest and asking you really good questions that help you think about your thinking and yourself in a in a new and different way to find those blind spots as you you called out earlier. It's your caddy. It's your mental caddy. I'll go back to the golf references, baby. <laughs> I can't wait to I can't wait to come to to Dallas and play golf, man. My uh my brother's moving there here shortly, so I'll be there a lot a lot more. We'll make it happen. Although you might have your hands full, it sounds like. So so you you find this therapist, you start working with them. Do you still see the same therapist? What does your mental health regimen today look like? Yeah, I do. I check in from time to time, about every six months or so, uh, just as a as a state of checking. And I'll tell you what, therapists, any therapist will tell you this, don't call me in a crisis, right? If you haven't seen me for months, the last time I want to hear from you is in a crisis. You need to be more regular. You need to have this kind of check where they can head things off at the past before it becomes a crisis. So, um, so I do that. So we talk. And, you know, the other thing too is it's, so now we're remote, right? She's out in Santa Monica. I'm out here. Um, I think that's kind of a challenge right now for folks. You know, they she really likes to establish a personal report in person, see how you present, you know, that in-person chemistry, and then you can build into a telehealth uh, relationship, uh, which the pandemic's making pretty difficult right now. Although we're probably all getting better at Zooming, so maybe there's something to that, you know, kind of reading the in-person online. But yeah, no, I do. I keep checking in with her. There is something, I've talked to my therapist about this too, there is something about the difference between being mm -hmm. able to start with that in-person 
connection, you know, we've got, we're social creatures and that proximity is certainly important. To your point, I don't, I don't think it's impossible to start virtual and in, in a lot of cases we don't have a choice, but there's something about being able to have that in-person connection that I, I imagine, or I remember several sessions that we would do over FaceTime where she knew my body language, she knew my nuances, uh, what I would do with my eyes, like just really knew me super well and you could pick up on that stuff. And I'm not sure if she would be, would have been as in tune with me had we not started off, you know, sitting at, sitting in an actual office. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important if you can make it happen. I think these are extenuating circumstances, but obviously. Yeah. So still, still seeing a therapist today. And at some point in time, you're like, this is a problem. Let's go do something about it. Tell, tell us the journey to get to starting tag that launches this week. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, well, it's kind of an odd journey. So, so I did a board game uh, a long time ago, sold at Walmart, Kmart all over the place. Um, it did well. And, and so I kind of the two ideas happened at the same time, the rights were coming back to me for distribution in the U S and I wanted to do another game, wanted to do that one, kind of revamp it. So I was in this gaming mode and, and, and mental health, just kind of that whole idea of therapy was always there in the background. Like how could that be solved in a different way? So tag stands for the anxiety game. And it started out as, as a game, it started out with points and badges and you earn your way through. And then we sort of, we tested that a little bit and it was a little convoluted and also mental health is not a game, right? <laughs> so conceptually, it wasn't quite a match, uh, but there was a kernel of an idea there about how do you take, you know, what is typically a lot of work and a little off-putting for people and make it really engaging. Something that maybe you'd even want to engage with if you weren't going through a mental health issue. And so that's where we landed on the current platform. That's what tag is. You see, you know, it's all about storytelling. So we have what we call our tag storytellers and they just get real and raw. They get open and honest, you know, like, like we're doing here today. And they, they share their story, uh, the good, the bad, what worked, what didn't, you know, how it impacted their life, what their triggers are, all that good stuff. And those are all condition by condition. And then we pair that video with game film. Right? So we take a clinician who's an expert in that particular topic and they break down what they're hearing. So they'll, you know, they reflect on it. They provide our subscribers with all kinds of advice, resources, but then those aha moment ideas, like I, I mentioned earlier, you know, self-talk. So that, that's what they get into. They get into things that you can apply immediately, you know, in your own life. And so the content itself, our goal is that that is just plain, compelling content that anybody would want to watch. And it gets that much more important for folks who, who share that experience. Yeah, I haven't been able to, to try it yet because you guys are, are just coming out and launching, but I'm, I'm super excited to, to get on the platform and poke around because I, I love the idea. And I think that's where you and I hit it off with coming on this show and me being interested in what you guys are building because it's all about storytelling. And... I wanted to ask you earlier about the stigma and what really helped you get over that stigma of like, uh, mental health, isn't that for crazy people? Like I need to be this tough guy. Like, what helped you get over that stigma of seeking out help? Yeah. Well, and even what, what furthered that stigma, I think is a personal thing. You know, you feel that you're admitting defeat when you're in that mode, right? You feel that, well, boy, if I, need to go see somebody that must mean I'm crazy. No, I'm going to hold off on that. I'm going to not do that yet. I think for me, uh, and people need to get over that, you know, that really is, that is not admitting defeat. That's admitting success is on the way. Um, and that's a hard thing for people to get to, but, but that is step one for me, it was family. You know, I have a, an incredible family an incredible support system. So there isn't any of that stigma talk, you know, uh, at, wasn't, uh, you know, uh, at, at the home front. So it was, it was, it was better for me to get there, but I did, I, I was stuck in that mode of, I, I'm not going to admit this. I'm not going to, you know, usher in that new chapter in my life. I'm just going to fight it and figure it out and power through. It just doesn't work. You know, we're not born experts in mental health. That's why we have PsyDs and PhDs and clinicians it takes years and years to understand the brain and that kind of chemistry. 
Yeah. So then what do you hope people will be able to get or experience by watching others kind of tell their stories and then hear experts talk about it? Is that, is that one of your ways of helping to kind of shift the stigma, if you will? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, well, number one, they'll see immediately that they're not alone, no matter the condition. You know, our goal is to scale up to the point where the library has something for everyone, a lot for everyone, no matter the condition. We've got um, a fellow on there now who speaks about pagophobia. Uh, and, and pagophobia, I'd never even heard tell, of. Tell me more. Pagophobia is the fear of swallowing. Oh, wow. And, and usually it's linked to certain foods. So if you're a kid grown up and you happen to choke on, let's say, a carrot, right? You can develop an anxiety around swallowing carrots and you physically can't swallow them. But then it also starts to translate into more and more foods and it becomes a nutrition issue. So you, you really struggle with being able to just eat. Uh, and so, so that's where we want to go. We want to be able to cover not only the, you know, the, the anxiety and depression topics, sort of the broad topics, but really get into everything that's, that's niche. Um, and we're also, you know, if you, if you think about therapy as a continuum and you think way out, um, way before there's a crisis, um, in fact, you might even have a friend going through something that you might resonate a little bit with because you may have thought that way too. What we're trying to do with TAG is cast a really wide net upstream to head off some of that crisis that happens further downstream. So we're hoping to give you tools, techniques, education, resources, um, all that you know. hopefully will help you not get to the point where you really hit crisis. And then if you do, now we've hopefully given you a vocabulary for what you're going through, right? We've maybe given you some tips that work, so it might be a softer landing for you. But the other thing that we're doing is because we have so many clinicians on the platform, you've now been able to interview for fit and for chemistry, right? So you get to see dozens of clinicians and how they interact with people and then through TAG, you can directly connect with one of those clinicians, you know, if you'd like. So, but yeah, we like to say that we're playing, you know, further upstream. Got it. And I I remember reading somewhere, maybe you and I talked about it, that there, you guys did some research or there's research out there that shows that just watching these sessions can be helpful on its own. And so for people who are sitting there thinking like, really, like, is it actually going to help me if I watch, you know, Steve talk about his anxiety and then Susan share what, like the, you know, what's actually going on here. What did you guys learn about that? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a partnership with the University of Texas, Austin, the graduate program there. Um, in fact, the founder of the anxiety that lab there, Dr. Michael Telch is on our team. And that's where we get a lot of the, the clinical underpinning, the, the scientific proof really for what we're doing. You can encapsulate tag. You can think about it as psychoeducation. And, and that is a treatment modality within, you know, therapy that is one of the most important. Um, and what it does for a patient is it lays the framework, the groundwork, the understanding for what it is that you are experiencing and how you're going to be treated. So it, it sets up success. Um, and an example of that would be, you know, let's say you're, you're claustrophobic. And day one in your therapy practice, um, your clinician says, okay, what I'd like you to do is to step into this closet. I'm going to turn out the light and shut the door. Well, that's exactly what you don't want to do, right? <laughs> this is my nightmare. This is my nightmare. Forget it. Um, and, but, but, you know, if through dialogue and maybe you understand what exposure therapy is and, and the way that we're going to step into this and the results that come from this, so it, it really, it sets the patient up for success. The other piece of TAG, just by watching stories and, and hearing other people talk, what a lot of people say about it is it's like attending a group therapy session. So let's say you go to uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, right? And you don't talk for six months. There is huge therapeutic value in you being there and watching the process happen. Watching folks talk about their story and, and really importantly, watching the clinician and the advice that comes from that, 
So we, we like to think of tag as group therapy, but the group is the size of a city, right? Uh, so that's, that's where we are. And, and uh, you know, the, the last piece I'd say on it too is it's, you know, we've been bubbling up this term in moment therapy. Um, if you're going through something, let's say that day you, you, you know, you have a breakup, right? And you're down um, and you want to talk to somebody about it. It might be a week, two weeks before you can get into that session. The feelings are no longer fresh. And by that time, you may not schedule that session, but maybe you should have. With TAG, it's in moment. You jump on the platform. There are dozens of videos going through exactly what you're going through. And while it's fresh, you know, you can get healing. So that's, a, that's another piece, I think, that makes us a little unique. I really like that. I, I think that that's so important. And it, it really just follows people's behavior in today's day and age, which is immediacy, always on real time is that these and these things don't wait regardless of if we had social media or not or what you know instant gratification has been increasing or not the fact of the matter is like when you're in that moment it can feel lonely it can feel scary confusing all those things and i yeah i just love the idea that somebody could pop pop into the app and i'm imagining you know search for whatever they're feeling at that moment in time assuming they've got the language for it and then watch somebody and be like, okay, I'm not crazy. I think I see a path for myself. Maybe reduces my, my, uh, trigger in the sense in the moment. And, you know, they can, they can move on in a healthier way than they would have beforehand. That's right. That's right. You know, and, and, and really in the way we built it, it was funny. We, when you say video, you know, what I had in my mind was masterclass. So let's get these things really polished and really high production value and tested that and that fell flat so when we got to this should feel like you're facetiming a friend both the storyteller and the clinician that's where we got the most engagement so those those in moment moments you know that they um they need to be just as authentic so the video you're watching needs to feel that it's you know hey this person is raw all these videos that are on here are unedited so it's just raw talk um, and I think that's important when you're, when you're right in that spot as well. Makes sense to me. I mean, it's like high production value makes me think, well, they put this person in the studio. How real is this? Was there a script? All those types of things versus, you know, wow, it, this just looks like this person popped up their phone and could have posted this on Instagram. Okay. This feels real. And that's, I mean, that's what everybody's looking for these days. It's like, show me something that is real. That's right. That's exactly right. Yep, that's where we landed. That's really cool. So what's what do the next couple of weeks look like for TAG? So next couple of weeks, we're getting the platform launched. Um, we will be user testing for a couple of weeks, poking holes, figuring out what's going to break. Uh, and then we will be doing some influencer promotion, uh, bring in the first wave of users, um, see what breaks then, right? If you, if you develop anything, you know there's something that's going to break. Yeah. Um, and so, and then after that, we'll be doing a, kind of a broad-based paid campaign, paid media campaign, um, inclusive of a whole bunch of different facets. I've got a number of interviews lined up, podcasts and whatnot, and we'll be releasing um, some, some white papers that our clinicians are putting together as well. So we'll have a few press releases and we'll be all also announcing the team uh, over the series of weeks. We got a rock star team that's built. It's kind of funny. We've got, uh, Let's see. So we've got a Super Bowl champion on the team. We've got two NC2A National Football Championships on the team. We've got a Grammy winner on the team. And we've got a multi Emmy winner on the team. Wow. Which was random. We didn't search for that. We just had that in kind of the friend and family network, mostly friend network. Um, and then obviously a number of fantastic clinicians. Uh, I think I mentioned Dr. Telch with UT. So we'll be, we'll be rolling out. You know, I really think that when you get into any new platform like this, it's you're, you're buying the people, you're buying the team, you're buying into the philosophy of the team. So I think it's important for us at launch to really show who we are. So that'll be a part of, of how we launch. That's cool. Yeah, no, I, I love making the broader team part of that story because they're, as the creators and influencers, if you will, of what gets developed and how it grows, 
their their persona and their stories are going to be such a key part of where you guys go and and how it's received i think yeah uh, absolutely absolutely so i i've been through a couple product launches you know inside of existing companies and you know startups that are entirely new things i know that they can be you know some some degree of stressful to exhilarating and uh and ever, everything in the middle but how are you in this moment uh, good. I think we're more on the exhilarating side. Um, I think the stressful side would be the kids. <laughs> that launch is going to be more stressful. Um, but, you know, fortunately, I've, I've been down this road several times, um, have launched a number of different businesses. And so, I, you know, I like to say, too, in fact, I was talking to my dad about this is, you know, each time you you launch, you sort of go, okay, step A, step B, step C, got it. Okay, great. Next one, A, B, C, D, E. Okay, take it a little bit further, D, E, F. And you sort of build this complete company through the process of trying to build companies, right? Um, I have a couple that are still running and doing great, and I have a whole lot that just sort of fizzled out. But you just, you build each time, you get a little further along so that you see what that next step looks like. And I think I think it's a good time for us. The number of people that are on the team uh, were with me with prior efforts. And so it's a pretty seasoned group. So I feel good, you know, but you never know. It's the startup world. You can wake up tomorrow and uh, somebody that's got a whole lot more resources launches the exact same thing, right? Sure. So there's always that. Um, but, uh, you know, but even if they do, I think there's a lot of room in the market for this. I think this is probably going to happen whether we do it or not. Um, so we just want to be first and, and move fastest. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with that. There, there is so much space. There's such a massive need. I mean, this is one of those it, uh, VCs hate to hear it. It's like our market is everybody. But the answer is like, I mean, yeah, pr pretty much everybody needs something like this. And there's going to be multiple versions of it because that's what people need is different modalities, different takes, different uh, perspective styles, all that stuff to to find what resonates with them. But it's yeah. cool that you guys are going to are going to take a shot at this model. Yeah, no, I think it's great. We're excited. Everybody's fired up. This well, then with that, I'm with the kids, but we'll make it happen. Yeah, yeah. so let, we'll, we'll, we'll pivot here and start talking about your twins that are on the way. And I don't, I don't have any kids. We've got, we've got a puppy. My wife and I will have kids at, at some point in time. And I've got a bunch of friends that have had kids before. But like, what's going through your mind with having twins here in a week? I mean, what doesn't go through your mind having twins um, or kids in general? Uh, I'm kind of last in my family to have them. I had a lot of cousins. Everybody's got twins. So I was a late bloomer on that front. Or kids. No, I think um, we're just excited. The biggest thing for us was we wanted to go as far as we possibly could, you know, keeping them in there, keeping them in the oven. Uh, my wife, Kelly, has done a fantastic job. We've got she has 13 pounds of baby in her tummy right now. So either we're going to have Shaquille O'Neal or we're going to have the two Nielsen twins. We don't know yet. We'll find out in the hospital. But yeah, no, it's great. Um, she'll be at 38 weeks, which is really good. Uh, and they're good size. If they came today, we'd, we'd be in good shape. So we've gone through all the prep, got everything built in duplicate, got the two cribs, the two strollers, the two this, the two that. Everything is, you know, that's the way it goes. So the house has already been taken over and they haven't even shown up yet. <laughs> how do you how do you support your wife right now what does that look like uh, you know what i think you just whatever they need you you know you're there so you you pick up so i've picked up you know doing the house stuff and fortunately being able to work from home helps so uh you know the cleaning cooking all that and uh you just you know she doesn't know what each day is gonna bring so you just be there and you know she knows that I'm a, I'm a support stone that she can for anything. I think that's the, the most important thing. I think you also just sort of check your stuff at the door, you know, what you're going through because it, it's something you can manage later or uh, just kind of just, uh, I guess don't rock the boat would be a good message. You know, probably now is not the time to bring up some big new purchase that you want to go after or <laughs> it's just uh, kind of keep things clean and easy. Try and make her life as easy as possible. My uncle said uh, in a text, he said, royalty. 
your wife is now royalty. I said, okay, it's good. I like that. Oh, that's adorable. So, yeah. And I think keep it light. You know, we're, we both are, we like our fair share of humor. So got to keep the gags going. There you go. Yeah. I hope to, I hope to get to meet, meet her and your kiddos someday for sure. But it sounds like you're doing a great job of taking care of her. And when you said checking things at the door, making sure you don't rock the boat, maybe, you know, storing some stuff away for later, how, how does that impact you and how you're taking care of yourself? Oh, and I, I'm, I don't mean anything serious by that. I just, I think you, you have to also, and in fact, this is, this is a big piece that we'll be touching on soon, another wave of release caregiver issues, um, which get way overlooked. Yeah. You, know, you, you as a caregiver go through so much and um, aren't the focal point, right? And, and I, I don't call myself a caregiver in this situation right now. But, um, but I think you, you know, that's a whole category that is really untapped that we're going to go after. And, um, and at some point I will be, you know, in that position. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited to go down that path. That's cool. Yeah. I've heard from a lot of new dads, the sort of feeling when the baby's first here that you're like, knowing that you just can't do anything besides whatever whatever gets asked of you, because you, you can't necessarily feed it, um, and the baby wants to be with mom and needs to be with mom all the time, and you're just kind of like, all right, well, I'm, I'm here for whatever, like just trying to not screw anything up here. Mm -hmm. I think we, we got it a lot easier than they did. I think we should just count our blessings when it comes to having babies. <laughs> 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 you know, though, with twins, it's gonna be a little bit different. Um, you, know, you can't change both at the same time, might be a little hard to feed both at the same time, even hold both and soothe both. So I think yeah. I play a much bigger role than um, had we had a, a single kid. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, that's interesting. So you said you're looking forward to that. What, when you think about being a dad, what are you most excited about? You know, I, I just like watching this. So I have um, three nieces on my sister's side. I have a nephew on Kelly's side and I have three nieces on my sister's side. And uh, I just like watching them grow. I like watching how they think. What I think we're born so smart, and then we just get dumber and dumber and dumber the older we get. <laughs> the stuff that comes out of their mouth is unreal. So you know, and discovering their shadow, I mean, all that. I'm just looking forward to um, just seeing how they experience the world, you know, and making sure that they both play an instrument or sing. That'll be that'll be a priority. <laughs> Oh, musicality is a key th key thing there. Yeah. What, when you think about, let's see, I think, did you say that it's a boy and a girl? Yeah, boy and a girl. Yep. Okay. Foster and Ellington. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. How do you think about how you're going to teach your son what it means to be a guy and to set uh, a good, strong, compassionate role model for your daughter? Yeah, you know, I think, um, I don't know if there's a playbook or a script, you know, it's a two-way street. So, um, you know, I think they are their own person uh, from the moment they breathe, right? They have their own personality. Uh, and I think you you work with that. I, I don't think I have a, here's my checklist to make you a man, right? You're going to be whatever kind of man you're going to be. Um but I think you're just there to make sure that they're making the right decisions, right? So whatever comes up, you're there to encourage them. Uh, but, you know, I grew up with a great dad. I grew up with somebody who respected women, um, is a man, man, right? Um, is also, uh, you know, I would say artistic, very artistic. He's, a, he's an architect, um, but has a, a, a hugely artistic side, which I hope my son gets too. Um, so yeah, fortunately I had a good role model, you know, so we'll, we'll go down that path. Take the, the Richard K. Nielsen approach. That's cool. Yeah. It's uh makes, it makes a big difference when you've got a, a good role model that kind of led the way for you. What are you the most afraid of, or what gives you a little, what makes you uncomfortable with being a dad? Well, I think any health issue mm. you want to be healthy at that point, you know, I think you're good. So we're, um, yeah, we're knocking on wood that things will go well that way. I also, I hope 
when he's a teenager, he doesn't come home drunk and park the car on the lawn. That's, if, we can, <laughs> if we can avoid that, I think it's a win, pretty much. Um, you, you know, like, the thing would be I'm a little bit older. You know, I'm 47. So, um, you know, making sure I have the energy to keep up. I recently went vegan. Oh, wow. Then, yeah, yeah. It's actually not as hard, I think, as people think. Nowadays, there are so many options. But I watched this movie. It feels like the hardest place to go vegan, though, would be in Texas. Well, yeah, and it kind of has a funny outcome. But I so went vegan for a couple of I watched the I watched the movie Game Changers. Um, and if you haven't seen it, it's fantastic. It's about this movement in professional sports to move to plant-based. Uh, a plant-based diet and they get into the chemistry and it's, it's, uh, it's incredible. I mean, the, the pre and post for these athletes. So it's a big push right now, uh, kind of get that extra edge. Um, but it's harder to eat that way if you haven't eaten that way your whole life. So Tom Brady, the TB12 diet is primarily plant-based and then you mix in a little bit of meat here and there. So that was my plan always, but I was going to do vegan for 90 days. My wife made some fantastic chicken noodle soup. So I kind of got off that train. So now I'm just going right toward TV 12. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So that means that the next time we talk, we can talk about your diet. We can talk about sleep. We can talk about fatherhood. We can see how the company's going. So this is going to be like a good little mini longitudinal study of your, uh, your mental and emotional and physical well-being. I love it. I love it. Let's do it. Absolutely. Well, I, I'm certainly thinking about your family first and foremost this week and send you guys all kinds of uh, sure. health and love and anything that you're going to need uh, to bring these two lovely souls into the world. So, uh, so incredibly excited for you. And then same thing goes uh, with the company. Wish you guys the, the best of luck and can't wait to follow along and support in any way that, that we can here at the mandate. Excellent. I love it. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on for sure. Looking forward to coming back. Yeah, it was it was a pleasure. We'll we'll see you here in a couple weeks, months, or whatever whatever it ends up being. Excellent. All right, man. Take it easy. Thank you. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Mandate with your host Adam Hoffman. It's time to do your part in raising awareness of men's mental health, shifting the stigma, and having a positive impact on someone's life. Share this episode with a friend who could use some support, and post it on your social channels. Have questions or thoughts? Text Adam at 512-980-3935. Find more episodes, upcoming live shows, and life-changing resources at mandateshow.com. Your mandate is to take your mental health seriously. Be courageous, stay vulnerable, live authentically. Until next time, y'all.